what is special about uh, humans is the power, expressive power of our communication system. So in principle, um, any thought that I can think, I can communicate to you, I can convey to you through language. So human, language, human languages have unlimited expressive power. In contrast, the expressive power of the communication systems of these animals is very limited. So these guys can talk about basically three things. Male chaffinches just sing to attract females and, and repel males, uh, and so on. So human language has far more expressive power than any other naturally occurring communication system. And that expressive power in language comes from um, what linguists sometimes call duality of patterning. So, um, and all languages work like this, basically, all this example is from English. So, um, a language provides a set of um, phonemes, contrastive um, speech sounds, basically. And these are individually meaningless, but we combine them and recombine them to form words, to build words. Okay, so this layer of recombination arising from phonemic coding means we can take up um, a, a set of, say, 40-ish phonemes that you have in, in, that I have in, in, in my variety of English, and I can recombine and recombine those phonemes to get a store of, say, 100,000 words. So that's quite a lot of expressive payoff from a, a fairly kind of rudimentary um, articulatory apparatus. That's the first layer of patterning. But then these words are themselves recombined. Okay, so I can take the words that I've built through this process of recombination, and I can recombine them in various orders, okay, in a rule-governed fashion to um, uh, convey information about sets of events in the world. So in this case, the dog bites the man. Okay, so there are these um, morphemes, so words, and then bits of inflectional morphology. I combine them these in certain orders. At orders, I can describe certain states of affairs in the world. And once I have the second level of, of um, combination plus some other kind of features of a language, then I can say anything I want. So this generates an unlimited set of um, meaningful utterances. And if you know the language, then any of the sentences I can generate in this way, you can uh, interpret and understand. Okay, so this is an amazing trick for a communication system to have, this duality of patterning, this phonemic coding plus compositional syntax. Today I'll mainly be talking about um, the evolution of compositional syntax. But I'll use a catch-all term for, for both of these kinds of um, patterning, which I'll call structure. So languages have structure. And we want to know um, where linguistic structure comes from. How come language works like this? How come no other species has a communication system that works in this way? So there's at least a couple of explanations for, for why language works in this way. And, and, and this one, which I'm going to be arguing against, I'll call the standard explanation. It's a, pretty, it's a, it's a good explanation, right? I think it's not quite right, but um, I'll look into a little bit why you might think that this is a good explanation. So the idea behind the standard explanation is that um, Structural properties of language, duality of patterning, phonemic coding, compositional syntax, are hardwired into an evolved language pattern. So basically, but having those features makes language useful for communication. So therefore, we should just say that those features are a reflection of some evolved piece of biological equipment that's evolved in humans and no other species. The alternative I'm going to argue for today is that at least some aspects of linguistic structure might be or are best explained as a consequence of and cultural evolutionary processes or co-evolutionary processes where genes and culture co-evolve. And I'll explain what I mean by cultural evolution in a minute. Before I do that, I just want to, to, to look at why the standard explanation is a, is a, is a good starting point to explain um, structure in language. Okay, so language is a human universal. There are no human populations that don't have a language. And wherever you look, at least at a first approximation, um, all human languages work in approximately the same way and they have the same sorts of expressive um, potential. So this is a Huli Wigman, um, these guys live in um, uh, New Guinea, these people are speakers of Piraha, the language spoken in um, the Amazonian rainforest, these guys are um, speaking uh, Nicaraguan Sign Language, which is one of the youngest languages in the world, it's a sign language that arose in the last 50 years or so, and schools to the death in Nicaragua. These are all human languages, you don't find any human populations who don't have a language. So it seems like there might be some um, universal property of humans that means wherever you find humans you find language. And language is also really useful. So this is a, a, a picture of the Earth uh, at night as seen from um, the International Space Station. So humans basically occupy the entire planet um, and will even spread beyond the planet. Right? So no other species has an International Space Station, it's just us. Um, and one of the reasons we've been able to achieve this is because of our uh, sophisticated technologies and the reason we have societies and the reason we have sophisticated technologies and sophisticated societies is because we have language. So having language enables us to network our intellects, exchange information, communicate and solve problems, and that's a massively adaptive trait at the species level, it's kind of enabled us to um, 
achieve massive numbers to spread over the whole planet, but at an individual level, it may also pay to be able to communicate. So it seems like language is adaptive. Individuals who communicate should do better than individuals who can. So putting those, those two together, it seems perfectly reasonable to suggest that maybe um, the capacity for language is just an evolved piece of, of biological equipment in humans. It's evolved by uh, kind of relatively well understood processes of, of, of Darwinian evolution, evolution by natural selection. This is a quote from an excellent paper by Steve Pinker and Paul Bloom, quite old now, but they say all modern students of language agree that at least some aspects of language are due to species specific, past specific biological abilities. Uh, so that's consumption. Uh, languages show signs of complex design for the communication of propositional structures. In other words, language looks like it's well designed to allow you to express your thoughts. The only successful account of the origin of complex biological structure is the theory of natural selection. So therefore, language is the biological ability, uh, ability which is evolved by natural selection. And that's the standard explanation. Okay, so um, here's one way to think about the standard explanation. Individuals have um, some genes. They end up with a grammar, so some mental knowledge of how the language that they speak works. Um, and learning is involved in building that grammar in your head. So the reason the way I sound the way I do is that I grew up around other people who sound like this. Okay, so there's some influence of learning that enables you to build your mental model of your, your language. But the idea is that your genes constrain this learning process. They um, uh, require you or, or push you towards learning certain kinds of languages, certain kinds of grammar. So there's like a blueprint from the genes imposing on this learning process of shaping the kinds of grammar that you learn. And then you pass on your genes to your offspring. Uh, the genes determine what kinds of gra mental grammars you could build. And there's selection acts on this transmission. So some languages are better than others. It's nice to have a language which enables you to communicate a large range of thoughts. Therefore, there's going to be selection here for genes that build grammars that are expressive, say. So it's going to be biological evolution of the language faculty, the genes behind language learning, down this route of transmission. Okay, so that, that's that's a nice idea, but the problem is that it misses. Uh, there's a, there's a kind of uh, a, a few missing arrows in this diagram, basically. So the, the the utterances that you learn your language from are not provided by the uh, by the physical environment. They come from other people, okay, and the, the utterances that I'm producing reflect my mental model of how English works. Okay, so. Um, you don't just, once you've learned a grammar, it doesn't just sit in your head, you use it to produce utterances. That's what I'm doing now, producing linguistic behavior. I've got kids at home, I talk to them, um, and they're, 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 the way I talk to them is influencing their uh, development of language in, the, in, in my children. Okay, so you see some utterances, and based on this kind of possibly genetically constrained learning process, you build a grammar. Okay, so um, language is a classic dual transmission system. The capacity for language is transmitted genetically, but languages themselves are transmitted down this um, stream. This is the cultural stream. Okay, so um, you get utterances, you learn a grammar, and then you use that grammar to produce more utterances, which other people might learn from. And languages are transmitted down this stream, not down this stream. Okay, so language is potentially the consequence of two evolutionary processes or two co-evolutionary processes. There's biological evolution of the capacity for language, and then there's cultural evolution of, of languages or language itself acting down this stream. So um, Pinker and Bloom essentially forgot about this stream in that, in that um, BBS article. So when, they, so when they said the only successful account of the origin of complex biological structures, the theory of natural selection, that's true. But um, language isn't just a product of biology. It's a result of dual transmission, genes and culture. And therefore, there's a second potential explanatory mechanism to explain why language has structure. It could be biological evolution acting down this strand. It could be cultural evolution, change over time as a result of cultural transmission that within this strand, or more likely it's an interaction of both processes. Okay, so we can't just think about biology and the evolution of the language faculty, we have to think about how genes and culture might um, interact to shape language. And I'm going to focus on the role of cultural evolution in delivering language structure. <coughs> so the basic idea is that language is passed from person to person by learning. Um, language has to be learned to survive, and structure, things like phonemic coding, compositional syntax, duality of patterning, rules and regularities in language, make languages easier to learn. Learners can grab hold of those rules and regularities, and that facilitates learning. Okay. So it might be the case that languages evolve to have structure, because having structure enables those languages to be successfully learned and transmitted. So rather than us evolving to have language, maybe language evolves to um, uh, be learnable by us. Okay. So, that sounds a bit mental when you just say it like that. I'll, I'll present some experimental and modeling evidence that shows that this can happen. Okay, so I, I want to um, 
argue that linguistic structure, and in particular, um, kind of basic elements of compositional syntax, so the fact that we have um, basically um, rules for combining meaningful units, um, that, that, that kind of linguistic structure might be a consequence of cultural evolution. And in particular, cultural evolution in response to two pressures. A pressure for learnability, arising from transmission of language to naive individuals, and then a pressure for language use. You actually want to use your language to communicate, to express um, relevant concepts or, or relevant distinctions in the environment. And this favors um, uh, complex or expressive languages. And when you have both of these pressures at play, then you get out structured languages that look a bit like human languages. Okay, so all of this is going to be based on what we call iterated learning models. Um, I'm going to present um, experimental iterated learning. So this is where you get people into the lab, you ask them to learn and produce languages, and I'll present some simulation models of the same process. So basically, language is a dual transmission system. Um, let's just forget about the genetic transmission strand. Let's just see what happens to the language when it's transmitted in this way. When you have um, learners who are learning a system based on data, which is produced by people who learn their system in the same way. That's iterated learning. You can simulate this, and I'll talk about a simulation model later on. You just have a little simulated model of a learner, simulated model of language use, and you see what happens to a language that's been transmitted in this way. But you can also do the same thing in the lab. You can get people into the lab, you can ask them to learn that communication system, then use that communication system, and you can string people together in what we think is called a diffusion chain. Um, and you can see what happens to that, um, that miniature language as it's passed from person to person <coughs> in the lab. So that's where I'll, I'll start with an experimental model of and iterated learning, iterated um, artificial language learning. That's what we call it. Okay, so this is the only bit of the talk that's uh, based on a published paper. This is a four years old now. This is joint work with um, Simon Kirby and Hannah Cornish. Um, so at the heart of this, um, this uh, bit of the talk is a, an artificial language learning experiment. So we got a bunch of people into the lab and we asked them to learn a miniature language. And what this miniature language did was provide them with labels, words, if you like, for a set of 27 pictures. So they had to um, learn how to label pictures that looked like this. Um, black, red, or blue shapes, could be square, circle, or triangle, and they could be moving in a straight line, bouncing, or looping. Okay, so those are, those are the objects in the world you have to describe using your miniature language. Uh, and in the language you're trying to learn, each of these pictures is associated with a label, just type text, makes it easier. We get a bunch of, these are adult participants, we get them into the lab, we train them on a target language for half an hour or something, I'll show you how, what training looks like in a second. Basically it's just pairings of pictures and labels. And then after that training phase, you test them, uh, you give your participant a picture and you say, what's the label for this? Um, and that's all they have to do. So it's presented as an alien language learning task. Right? They don't use the language to communicate, they don't get any feedback on how they're doing during testing. Um, there's no other participant they can even communicate with. They're just on their own trying to learn this alien, strange alien language. Okay, so this is what training looks like. You see a label paired with a picture for a total of six seconds. And then you get another label and another picture. So Gippy is in the language you're trying to learn is a label for a, a, a red square which is the right. Wiggy or Wiggy is a, a, a red triangle bouncing. Kunige is a blue square looping and so on. You sit looking at these kinds of exemplars from this target language for half an hour. And then at the end, you get some test times. You're given a, um, a, a picture and you have to type in the label in this box. Okay, so for you guys, you only got a very brief training exposure then. Um, uh, you didn't actually see a label for this. So you're not sure what the correct label is. And also, there were no rules or regularities in that little sample of data. I gave to you from a, 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 um, an unstructured kind of random language. So there's no um, right answer to this task. So what your participants do, well, they just say, well, I'm not sure what the label is. Maybe it's font that sounds about right to me. Okay, and they get a bunch of test items like this. They type in the labels. And then we iterate this. Okay, so we have our first participant who comes into the lab and they get trained on a random language. So every 20, each one of those 27 pictures has a randomly generated label associated with it. So that's an unstructured, not language-like system. It, no rules or regularities. Every label is just an arbitrary label for the, the thing it refers to. So this poor guy tries to learn that horrible system, and then on desk, he's, he's very flustered, he just he provides some new labels for us. And we take those labels and use that as the target language for a second participant who um, learns as best they can and produces new labels for us on text, and we take those labels that this individual produces and we use those to train a third individual, and so on. So the miniature language starts off unstructured, not language-like, and it's passed from person to person to person. And we're interested in what happens to that language as it's transmitted in this way. So that is, this is a kind of parallel to the transmission of actual languages from individual to individual. 
um, in the wild. Um, so we run 10 generations, uh, so this is a single generation, 10 such generations, uh, and we run four chains, four independent chains, starting from different random languages. Understanding how this, this methodology works is really important. Right? So passing of initial random language, passed from person to person to person. Is there any questions on how that method works? So the yeah. second generation get a new set of labels. So you get, this person is trying to learn the language that this guy produced on test. So he produces, he gets, he sees a set of picture label pairs, and then he's prompted with pictures, and he types in the labels, and that gives us a new set of picture label pairs, and we use that to train this set. All right, so they get, okay, all right. So it's like Chinese whispers, right, a broken telephone. So the language gets passed from person to person. The pictures, they see are the same. Yeah, same, same set, same set of pictures, it's the labels. Get different labels. Yeah, the labels yeah. that changes, or the labels that might change, right? So if the language is, high, is extremely well learned, then this guy will reproduce it perfectly, and therefore she will be seeing the same language as him. So if the language is well learned, it's not going to change through this process. But if mistakes are made, the language might change. But it's the labels that change. So the, 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 the world provides these 27 things we need to talk about. Yes? So if she's receiving the uh, label that he's typed in, yeah. what's stopping him from just typing red, bounce, and square? Uh, they're told not to do it. And surprisingly, people actually don't do that. Okay. So uh, when I show you the results, you might see some very big hints of things that look a little bit like English. But surprisingly, if you tell people not to use English, then they don't. There are there are there are manipulations we can apply to, um, that we that we use subsequently to make sure they don't type in English. But it just turns out people wing or something like that. Hmm? Use wing bangs. You could do something like that. So that's something that's something we've used in other experiments. But in this case, we just we just said people don't type English, and so they didn't. And they get a lot of training right in the target language, so they know they think they're they think they're just being tested on, and they are being tested on their ability to learn this this strange language. And so they, they do their best. And they know that that language wasn't English, so they don't type in English. Yeah, people are people are people do people try really hard in experiments. <laughs> Any other questions? So sorry, I may have missed it. The users are definitely not aware of the, the Chinese whispers process. They don't they, they think it's just a they yeah. think it's just an artificial language learning experiment. They don't know they're in a diffusion chain. So they don't they don't know they think they're just trying to learn a language that the experimenter is providing for them. They don't know that that language might have been generated by another person. Okay, so what happens to the language as it's passed from person to person? It starts off random and unstructured, right? Not like a human language. Um, so this is a graph of uh, generation number. So generation one is the person who's trained on this horrendous random language. Generation two is the person who's trained on generation one's output and so on. So this is a measure of error. So this is a measure of how accurately, how close the labels you typed in uh, on text were to the actual labels in the language you were supposedly learning. So the poor first individuals trained on random languages do horrendously badly. Right? Random languages are really hard to learn. But what you see is generation on generation a reduction in error. So this person is a bit better at learning this language than this guy did on the original language. By the time you get to generation 10, the languages are being transmitted from person to person with a very low error. Okay, so this looks a bit dodgy, right? This error bar is too low, so here's the individual chains. So what you see is that in all the chains, error is very high at the start, and the error reduces generation on generation. Two of the four chains, the languages are being transmitted from person to person with zero error in generation 10. So the languages are the languages are evolving to become more learnable. And that's what this plot shows. This is a, a significant reduction. There's a trend downwards. Okay. So languages are changing to become more learnable as a result of pressure to be more learnable. Okay, so the question is what do these languages look like? How are they achieving this trick of becoming increasingly learnable? So here's an initial language from a particular chain. So the way to read this is that these are all the labels for black shapes blue shapes and red shapes. This block of nine is the label for uh, things moving to the right, bouncing things and looping things, and then you have a row for square circles and triangles within each of these blocks. So Kikumi is the label in this initial random language for a red square bouncing. Yeah, so, so how do you actually produce these? Is this based on like many of them or something? Uh, so there's just a set of there's basically a set of nine syllables, mm -hmm. and they're they're just they're, we've got a set of consonants, a set of vowels. It's kind of it's like roughly a kind of Polynesian flavor. So it's all CV syllables, and then we just pick random syllables from that bag. And I wrote measured based on syllables on characters. It's, it's Levenstein string edit distance. This measure is uh, is string edit distance between the target label and the actual label. It's normalized for the length of the longer um, label. Okay, so this is a horrible language to have to learn. There are no rules or regularity. You just have to memorize the individual label for each individual picture. Uh, and that's the, the task that faced the first participant in this particular chain, chain four. 
Here's the final language in that chain, 10 generations later. Okay, so two things jump out. First of all, it's got far fewer words, right? They're just five words now rather than 27. But also those words aren't just dotted at random around the space. They're organized in a sensible way. If something moves to the right, it's called a touche. If something loops, it's called a poi. And if something bounces, it's a two pim if it's a bouncing square. Mini ku if it's a bouncing circle. And two pim if it's a bouncing triangle. And you forget about color. Okay, so the language has got um, become more learnable because it's shared words. But also, those words are distributed around the meaning space in a sensible way. So we say it's become systematically underspecified. Words now pick out sensible, sensibly kind of related groups of meaning. Okay, so that's nice. It's not really what we're after. This isn't. This is kind of like words, but not really like linguistic structure. We're looking for a kind of compositional syntax. Right? This, this certainly doesn't have a compositional syntax. This. Sorry, Carol. What's happened to the color? They just don't care it's about color. Nice. Yeah. So what a participant said who was trained on this language, they said the, the aliens who produced this language don't care about color. Right? So they've lost it. There are no linguistic distinctions. Linguistic distinctions in this language based on color. Yeah, yeah. But 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 uh, these aliens don't. Okay, that's what the participant said. Okay. This is actually so. This language is, is um, simpler, right? It has fewer words, um, and there's also a generalization you can make about which word you should apply. Okay, so I can state the rules for which labels appear where in the language. So the language has become compressible. It's a simpler language than the additional language, and that's why it's more learned. <coughs> this is actually the most complex language we've got in these four chains. Here's the simplest language. Okay. <laughs> Everything's called Nepa, unless it's a uh, Blue square doing a loop and it's called Nemini. Right. So this is obviously a very simple language. Right? And this is highly learnable. So I don't know what the participant who was asked to learn this language thought we were doing. I don't know they thought we were, uh, thought we were mad, but we paid them so they didn't care. Okay. So um, this language is highly learnable, but it's what we want to call a degenerate language, right? It's not like a real human language. This was this 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 would be like a language where you have one word for everything and one exception. Right? So it's easy to learn. But it's not it's not communicatively useful. Okay? I can't convey any distinctions using this language. So it's, not, it's highly learnable, but it's not very functional for communication. And this other language, if we ran these chains for longer, would eventually get to this kind of state. If all you have to do is be learnable, then the optimal setup for a language is to be a language with just one word. Okay? That's the most learnable language. It's the most simple, most compressible language. Just one word for everything. And this one's got quite close to that ideal. Okay, so um, learners prefer simpler languages. That's the conclusion we can draw from that experiment. And in that experiment, the only pressure on languages is for them to be learnable. Okay? They don't care about being used for communication. All the language wants to do is to be transmitted with lower error from person to person. And therefore, the languages don't need to be expressive. There's no break on that learner preference for simplicity. And therefore, the languages get very, very simple. And unlike real human languages, which are very expressive and which can convey a whole bunch of um, important distinctions. Okay, so the question is, can we modify this kind of experiment to reintroduce a pressure for expressivity, put a break on this learner-driven and preference for simplicity? Okay, so there's a couple of things we can do. We tried something in that paper, and we'll tell you about a new, a kind of more satisfying way of doing this, which is just to add a pressure for communication. So rather than just learning your language, you want to learn a language and then use it for communication. Okay, so in experiment one, we had these very simple diffusion chains. Experiment two is based around the same sort of setup, but rather than just learning a language, you learn a language and then you have to use it to communicate. So these guys are both trained on a random initial language, and then they use it to communicate with each other. They have to, um, I'll explain how communication works in a second. And then the language they produce while communicating is used to train another pair of individuals, a fresh pair of individuals. These guys try and learn the language that these guys produce, and then they use it to communicate with each other, and then that language is passed on. These guys learn it and use it to communicate, and so on. So now the language wants to be learnable, because new individuals are learning it every generation, but also wants to be useful because these guys have to use the language in interaction to communicate. Okay, so this is uh, an imprint paper. Hopefully, it'll be submitted before Christmas. Uh, slightly different meaning space this time. So rather than 27 pictures you want to communicate about, there are just 12. It makes the experiment much more runnable. And um, there are three different shapes and four different fill patterns for those, those, those shapes. And that gives us 12 um, pictures that you have to learn labels for. As before, uh, the, labels, uh, the language provides a label for every picture. You're trained on a set of picture label pairs as before. But now on testing, rather than just being asked to type in the label for a particular picture, you're asked to um, communicate with your partner. So on every round, one of you is the director, one of you is the matcher. The director is given a picture and told, communicate this to your partner by typing in a label. 
Now the partner, the matcher, gets the label provided by the director and has to guess what they were talking about. You have to select the correct reference from an array of these um, pictures. And you get told whether a communication was successful or not, and there are even prizes. Right? You can win mo more money by being good at this communication task. Okay, so rather than the language just having to be learnable, it now has to be learnable, but also useful for communication. And then we just plug this task into the iterated learning framework. So these guys communicate, and then we take the date, the language they produce while communicating, and we use it to train these guys, and so on. Okay, so um, if you run this, you see the error goes down, the scores go up. Um, but you can also look at what the languages look like. Okay, so this is an initial, um, what's called a holistic language. So there's a distinct label for every one of these pictures, but there's no um, structure to this language. Um, so every picture just has an arbitrary label, and you just have to memorize the set of associations. We ran, sorry, I should have said we ran four chains like this, each of six generations. These are a bit more labor intensive because you have two people every generation. Um, plug in an initial language like this, you come back six generations later. And you get a language that looks like this. So this language now has a very simple um, kind of compositional morphology. Right? So there's a little bit messy, there are some exceptions, but basically uh, most of the labels have two parts. There's a first part which tells you the shape, so this is an eggy, this is a mega, this is a gamini, and then the second part of the word tells you the fill pattern. So it's roughly wow woo for black ones, wow wow for the jetty ones, and woo woo for the dotty ones. And then the unfilled ones are about a, a, like, a no marker on the end. So this language now has a very simple system, a little bit messy, but you have basically some words for shape, some words for color, and then you combine them in this rule governed way. You'd say the, the shape and then the color. Okay, so in this experiment, there's a pressure for languages to be learnable because they have to be learned by naive individuals. But there's also a pressure for languages to be expressive. You want to be able to communicate with your partner. You want to be able to type in a label that enables your partner to figure out what object you were talking about. So that's a pressure for expressivity. When you have both of these in play, it seems like you get linguistic structure. Okay, you get a very simple little um, rule-based language. Uh, okay, so why is that? Well, learners prefer simpler languages. When you come into the lab, you have to learn a language. You want it to be nice and simple. Um, so that's a pressure, a pressure for compressibility of the language. But when you come to use that language, you want it to be expressive. So what the what the language does is it figures out what the what the what the, it tries to optimize both of these pressures um, simultaneously, and it figures out the, the best solution, which is to be both simple and expressive. Okay, and, and the kinds of languages we get out are roughly like this. They're the simplest possible languages, which provide a distinct label for every picture. So they have seven words basically, four words for uh, pattern and three words for shape, and then they have one rule, which says stick these together. Um, and that's the most compressed possible uh, system which will generate you 12 distinct labels. Okay, so if you just have a pressure for learnability, you become degenerate. If you have a pressure for learnability plus expressivity, you become structured, like real languages. Okay, so the question is, can, can we kind of um, um, fill out this paradigm? Can we keep the pressure for expressivity and take away the pressure for learnability? If we do that, what kinds of languages will we see? Okay, so this is experiment one, this is experiment two. Experiment three is exactly like experiment two. Exactly the same um, computer program that we run. Exactly the same um, training and testing paradigm. The only difference is that in experiment, in experiment two, we um, introduce new participants every generation. In experiment three, we just keep the same two people in the lab for four hours. But they go through exactly the same procedure. Okay? So they communicate. They learn a random language. They communicate. They're trained on the language they produced while communicating. They communicate using that. They're retrained. They communicate, and so on. So these guys are in the lab for four hours. So now there's a pressure for the language to be expressive, but there's very little pressure for it to be learnable. Okay? Because these guys are only naive learners once, right at the start of the experiment. Sorry, yes. are they retrained using the strings that they generated themselves, or another set of ROM strings? No, the strings that they generated themselves. So exact, it's exactly like this. right? So these guys are trained on the language that these two produced. These guys are trained on the language that these two produced. And it just happens that these are the same people, and these are different people. But the, the, the computer program is the same in both conditions. Just the, you, you, basically, you either bring in new people or you force the same people back into the woods. Okay, so in that situation, you start with a random language, and what you get out is a language which is basically still holistic. It's still random. Okay, so there's some little, slightly odd things happening, um, but roughly speaking, um, you have 12 separate labels here, and there's a distinct label for every picture. And there's certainly no obvious um, here's the word for color, here's the word for shape. There's no compositional morphology in this language. It looks like a fairly arbitrary association of um, 12 uh, fairly complex labels with these 12 pictures. So the language does not become structured. 
So learnability only, you get a degenerate language. Learnability plus expressivity, you get a structured language. Expressivity only, you get a holistic language, which is expressive, but not very compressible, not very simple. Okay, so the theory, the theory that we are kind of, the reason we ran these experiments and the way we interpret the results is as follows, right? There's three types of languages, roughly. Degenerate languages, which have only one label. Structured languages, which are language-like, they have words and rules for combining them. And then holistic languages, which have an idiosyncratic, unstructured set of labels, one for every concept you want to communicate with. These guys are nice and compressible. This is the most compressible possible language, the degenerate one. These ones are um, less compressible, there's more words and there's a rule for combining those words, um, but they're still relatively simple, they're relatively compressible. You can form a little, a simple grammar for these languages. Okay. So the pressure from learning and transmission favors languages which work like this. Okay. The general languages are best, structured languages are okay. On the other hand, these languages are expressive, right? So both the structured languages and the holistic languages provide a distinct label for every meaning you want to communicate them. So if you're using your language to communicate, then you want your languages to be structured or holistic. Okay. In our first experiment, only this mattered. In our second experiment, only, uh, uh, in our third experiment, only, only this mattered. In the middle experiment, experiment number two, when you have pressures for both um, learning, favoring compressibility, and pressure for communication, favoring expressivity, uh, what you get out of structured languages, which satisfy both those requirements. They're both simple and expressive. Okay, so that's the theory, but really we'd like to um, check that this is true. So we'd like to be able to, um, at will, and preferably without getting hundreds of participants uh, into the lab, and um, figure out what happens if we turn on or off or dial up or down these two pressures. And the way to do that is by um, uh, simulating iterated learning. Okay, so rather than do um, iterated learning with real people, we'll do it with simulated agents. Um, on a computer. And there's just a bunch of stuff you can do in simulation that you can't do in the lab. Um, so we can easily manipulate the pressure for expressivity. So when two people, the two humans communicate, they're learning from each other and also they're trying to convey their meaning and also they might be doing some quite smart stuff and making some clever changes to their language or doing, doing some complex stuff to try and convey their meaning. Right? Um, we can just disentangle all of those things with a simulation model. We can have uh, simulated agents who communicate with each other and learn from each other, but don't care about actually functionally communicating. They don't care whether their message or not gets across. It's hard to make people behave like that. Because we can do that easily in simulation. We can turn off the pressure of communication while keeping all other factors of the um, experiment the same. We can also turn on or turn off the pressure from the uh, new learners. So these two guys can be uh, new naive individuals, naive simulated individuals, or they can be the same guys as these. And we can keep these two poor simulated agents in the lab for hundreds of generations, right? Which you can't do with real humans. Okay, so I'm going to show you manipulations of these two factors. Basically the same manipulations we did in the experiments, and um, now in simulation with a whole bunch more runs. But there's other stuff we can do, right? So you might be worried that um, our experiments involve um, people who already speak a language, right? Maybe that has some impact on the kinds of communication systems they come up with. The way to solve that is to do a simulation. So these guys don't know English, right? they don't know any language. The question is, do you get the same results? Um, if you uh, use simulated agents who don't have access to a human language. You can also dial up or dial down their preference for simplicity. So we assume that learners have a fairly strong preference for simple, compressible languages. We can just manipulate that. That just becomes a parameter in the model. Um, and we can do cool stuff that, that we, that's hard to do in the lab. We can go beyond dyads and chains and look at um, transmission of languages on complex social networks. That's hard to do experimentally. It's easily, easy to do um, in simulation and so on. Right? So we've just constructed a simulation model Basically, models are experimental results. Because this is the 21st century, we're using uh, Bayesian models of learning. So each of our simulated agents behaves like a little uh, uh, rational learner. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this model works. Um, this is the first time I've explained this model to anyone, so uh, bear with me. It's a very brief explanation, so don't worry if you're looking at the plot. Okay, so we're using Bayesian inference, so your posterior probability of some hypothesis given some data uh, is proportional to and the likelihood of that data was produced by the hypothesis you're considering times the prior probability of that hypothesis. So you're just your belief before you've seen the data that that kind of hypothesis is likely to be correct. So in this uh, scenario, the data you're learning from is uh, linguistic utterances. So a pairing of a meaning in the experiment is a picture and a signal in the experiment as a type of sequence of letters. And it's going to be actually language use in context. Okay, so you're using the language to try and discriminate between um, a set of meanings. So that's the kind of data you're going to see. And your hypothesis that you're, that you're evaluating our languages. 
basically. Actually, the model is a bit more complicated than that. You're trying to learn distributions over languages. But the model's set up so the learners strongly prefer just to have a single language. So you can just imagine that they're, they're evaluating your data and say which language uh, is most likely given the data I have seen. And then in here we have our likelihood is our model of language use. What, how do you behave linguistically if you have a certain language in your head? And our prior is this place where the preference for simplicity arises. So a priori, learners prefer simple languages. They want a compressible language. Before they've seen any data, their expectation is that the system they're learning should be compressible. And we can just model a nice simple um, uh, compression-based uh, preference in learners. Okay, so um, the meanings and signals that these uh, simulated agents are communicating about are very simple, much simpler than the ones in the experiment. So meanings are just um, uh, two bit vectors. So there are four meanings, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And then signals are basically the same. Right? So let's call the possible signals A, 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 B, B, A, B, B. And a language just provides for every meaning a signal. Right? So there are four to the four question based uh, preference in learners. Okay, so um, the meanings and signals that these uh, simulated agents are communicating about are very simple, much simpler than the ones in the experiment. So meanings are just um, uh, two bit vectors. So there are four meanings 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And then signals are basically the same. Right? So let's call the possible signals A, 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 B, B, A, B, B. And a language just provides for every meaning a signal. Right? So there are four to the four possible languages. I'll show you a couple in a minute. Uh, so 256 possible languages. It's a very simple little model of, of a language. It has the features we need. Structured meanings and potentially structured signals. And the question is how do you line up these two sets of objects? Okay, and then we have a model of language use. And what language use basically says is you have a language in your head and what you do is that language tells you which utterance you should produce to convey a, a target meaning. And that's what you usually do. Uh, so that's just um, accessing your language and producing the appropriate utterance, the appropriate label. But if that utterance would be ambiguous in context, and I'll show you an example of this in a minute, then maybe you should try something else. Okay, so you want your message to get across, or you want to avoid um, ambiguous um, signals. Okay, so we can just model the pressure for communication. So say this is your language. Right? So what this says is that um, meaning 0, 0 goes to signal AA, meaning 0, 1 goes to signal AB, but now that we were slightly degenerate, right? So here we have two different meanings which map to the same signal. So this is not the, the this is a, a somewhat compressible language, but it's a somewhat, it's not the most expressive possible language, because this utterance is ambiguous. If I'm using this language in this context, then, so there are two meanings in the context, and I want to convey this one to the hearer. I want them to understand zero, zero, and not, I want to discriminate that from zero, one. Then here's the likelihoods. Okay, so basically my language says if you want to communicate 0, 0, you produce signal AA. And in this context, AA for a speaker of this language is not ambiguous. Okay, so the, this distractor meaning goes with AB, so therefore if I say AA and you speak the same language as me, you'll know what I'm talking about. So basically what this learner does is says, I'm going to produce AA given my language with high probability. This is the error rate. And with a very small probability, I'll do something else. By mistake, I'll use the wrong label. So this, ambiguous, this utterance is not ambiguous in context, therefore I just do what my language tells me to do. Uh, uh, on the other hand, if, if this was the context, so now I want to discriminate, um, sorry, I'm going to jump this. Uh, if this was the context, so I want to convey meaning one zero, I want to discriminate that meaning from meaning one one, now I have a problem, right? Because my language says that both of these meanings map to BB. So if you say, if you speak the same language as me, and in this context I produce a signal of BB, you have no idea what I'm talking about, right? Could be this, could be this. So therefore, all we do is we, we, the, the, the utterance BB pays some penalty. Okay, so in this case, if I say BB in this context, it's two ways ambiguous. There's two, um, two uh, references that you can pick out. Then all I do is just divide its, its kind of probability by a half. Okay, so this is all proportional. Right? So this one pays a penalty, and that makes me say something else a bit more likely. So the more ambiguous an utterance is, the more likely I am to not use that utterance in contexts in which it's ambiguous. And this is just parameterizable, right? So if we set alpha to zero, you don't care about whether your utterance is ambiguous or not. If we set alpha to one, you care a bit. If we set it to three, which is the value I used in the simulation runs, then you care quite a lot about not using ambiguous utterances. So this is just a model of trying to avoid being ambiguous. Uh, if your utterance is gonna make you ambiguous, then you don't do anything smart, you just say something else. So you're not cleverly constructing an utterance that will get your meaning across, you're just doing something else. Do you care that they don't add up to 
It's proportional, right? So it's so we just normalize. Okay, so this is a model of communication, right? The degenerate language is less expressive than the structured language, and the structured and holistic languages are equally functional, and right? they have four distinct labels. So this has the correct properties that we were looking for. And then we just have a nice, uh, simple compression-based prior. Learners prefer languages which have fewer forms, and learners prefer languages which are consistent. Okay, so this is the best language, right? It only has one form. So learners prefer this. They like, like nice, simple, compressive languages. Uh, if you're going to have a language with four forms, that's kind of a priori unlikely. These are quite complex languages. But this one is better than this one, okay? a priori, for the following reason. In this one, there's a nice, simple rule. Okay? If the meaning starts with a 0, the signal starts with an A. If the meaning starts with a 1, the signal starts with a B, and so on. So you can form a little compressed grammar for this language. So therefore, its a priori probability is, 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 is non-zero, or reasonable. This holistic language, you can't form any such rule, right? Sometimes when the meaning starts to zero, the signal starts to B, sometimes it's an A, the meaning starts to one, sometimes you have a B, sometimes you have an A. So this is a horrible, uncompressible, holistic language, and this has the lowest prior probability. So learners prefer degenerate languages or structured languages, and they don't like holistic languages. And that's what the prior looks like if you graph it, right, for the full space of languages. Most of the, the um, prior probability masses on the degenerate languages. Uh, languages with more forms, two forms, three forms, four forms, have lower prior probability. But within that number of forms, there are some languages which are better than other. So here is the four form compositional language. This guy. Okay. It has very low prior probability, but it has higher prior probability than the four form holistic language, which has virtually zero prior probability. Okay. So learners prefer simple languages, but language use prefers expressive languages. So the pressure for learning is pushing you towards these degenerate languages. The pressure for expressivity is pushing you up towards these languages against the prior. Okay, so now we have all the features we want. This is our theory. Pressure from learnability pushing this way. Pressure from communication pushing this way. And that's exactly what we have in the model. So now we can just run the model and see what happens. Okay, so here's what happens if you run a simulation of experiment one. So just to keep things simple, we'll have pairs of simulated individuals. And um, they communicate, but they don't care about producing ambiguous utterances. They don't care about communication. It's easy to simulate, hard to get people to do that in the lab. And then you take the language they produce, and you pass it on to the next pair, and so on. This is a time course of a bunch of generations, average over 50 simulation runs. And this is the distribution of languages you get uh, in the last 50 generations. Okay, so what you see is that the degenerate languages take over. Uh, they're the dominant language type. Most of the, most of the simulation runs have an over-representation of the degenerate languages. So that's exactly what we see in the simulations, in the experiments. If you just have a pressure for learnability, you get out of the degenerate languages. And we get the same thing in the simulation. Here's what happens if you now add in communication. So these guys communicate, and they really care about getting their message across. And then the language is transmitted to new, naive individuals over time. This is the four form compositional languages take over. So these are the structured languages. They went out just like they did in experiment. <coughs> so if you have pressure for learnability, plus pressure for expressivity, then you get out a structured language with rules. And here's what happens if you don't have naive individuals. So like in experiment two, you just keep the same two simulated agents in the lab. What you can't see is there's a line here for the holistic languages that starts at around 0.5 and jumps up and stays up here. You can see it better in the distribution. So um, these simulations are dominated by the four form, holistic, not structured, not rule governed languages. And that's the same result that we got in the real experiment. Okay, so the simulation model seems to match pretty closely the, um, the experiments. There's still a bunch of stuff we want to do with the simulation, so these results are only a couple of weeks old. Okay, so just to wrap up, we're interested in why language has structure. Um, and in particular, we want to know what's required for structure and language to evolve through cultural evolution. And I think these, the experiments and the models suggest that all you need is a general preference for simplicity and compressibility of the stuff you're learning. Uh, you need to be using your language to communicate, and you have to be communicating some of the time with naive individuals. And this actually differs across populations. Right? So in some populations, there's massive turnover and lots of interaction with people you've never met before, who don't know how you speak. Um, and what you seem to see in those languages is a pressure for simplicity, and more interaction with naive individuals. Um, the places where you get really complex and um, kind of messy um, human languages are in environments where there's very little interaction with new individuals. So like isolated mountain communities tend to have really complex, morphologically complex languages. Okay, so 
Um, communication, with, communication with naive individuals is the thing that introduces a pressure for simplicity. Okay. But once, once, the, once these pressures, the pressures are in place, then cultural evolution delivers you structure, delivers you well-designed languages that look like human languages. And there's basically nothing else for biological evolution to do. So coming back to why, why is language structured, we don't really have to worry so much about the standard explanation. We don't need to assume that language structure is hardwired into uh, language learners via biological evolution. Okay? Because there's basically nothing for biology to do. Right? Once you have people learning from other people and using their language to communicate, then you get out structured languages. You get out language-like uh, communication systems. With the caveat that linguistic structure only arises when you have both a pressure for transmissibility, for learnability, and also a pressure for communication. People want to communicate, and their language adapts to enable them to do that. The last slide, I promise. Um, so why, do, why are humans special? Why do only humans have a structured communication system? Why do only humans have this massively expressive and um, structured language? We're definitely not special because we need to communicate. Right? All of these animals need to communicate. And we're also not even special because we learn to communicate. Okay? So um, chaffinches and other songbirds learn their communication system. So needing to communicate is not enough to explain why humans have language. Learning to communicate is not enough to explain why only humans have language. Um, but it's some combination of the fact that <coughs> we learn to communicate and we require our language to meet certain expressivity requirements. We want to talk about complex stuff in the world, and our language has to change to enable us to make the distinctions that we want to make. Japanese just want to show off verbally. Okay, they don't have the same expressivity and pressures acting on their communication system that acts on um, human language. But once you have these pressures for learnability and pressures for expressivity, then the language adapts to produce uh, to produce structure that, that, that enables it to fulfill the communicative and learning needs of, of, of language users. Okay, thank you. Uh,